The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Hello, my name's James Wrigley. I'm a financial advisor and one of the principals of Melbourne-based financial planning firm, First Financial. I've been a long-term listener and contributor to the Ensemble Group and podcast, picking up some amazing nuggets of gold over the years. And through this podcast and the people that I'm able to speak to and interview, hopefully I can continue to deliver some of those nuggets of gold to you. IntelliFlow is on a mission to give more people access to financial advice. Their technology, IntelliFlow Office, powers and streamlines the advisory experience for over 30,000 financial advisors worldwide, making an impact at every stage of the advice process, including practice management, revenue management, cash flow modelling, client portals and more. IntelliFlow Office helps advisors manage all their client and provider data within a single integrated ecosystem that just works. Discover IntelliFlow for yourself by visiting IntelliFlow.com. Hello, welcome back to another episode. I'm James Wrigley. I've got the pleasure of speaking with Trish Gregory today. Trish, thank you for joining me. You're at Fox and Hare at the moment, but uh, I'm getting into a bit of your story. And we're going to talk women in uh, financial advice or financial planning. Uh, Trish, you've suggested some fantastic topics that we're going to get into. So really looking forward to this episode and thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here. Uh, my very first time on this podcast was when I just was joining Fox and Hare when Jess Brady was doing the podcast. And now I've been in the company for a bit over a year. So it's wonderful to jump on again and connect with you. You've been doing an amazing job. Come back again. What, I, what was your first episode about? I haven't listened to it. What, what were you talking about in that one? Probably similar things. I can't <laughs> even remember. It's it's a lot of what I talk about is women in financial advice. Yeah. So look, let's you know we, we tend to start all of these. We're going to get into a, a range of different topics: income gap, parental leave, uh, a lot, lot of other things, which we'll get to in a minute. But we tend to always start these chats with kind of tell me a bit about your story. Um, so you're at Fox and Hare now, so a, a little bit over a year. Is that how long you've been there for? Correct. So I started in April last year, 1st of April, and I was really hopeful that, you know, despite it being the 1st of April, that it wasn't a joke and the contract really was coming through and like, <laughs> but yeah, fun time to start. Um, so it's been, what's that now? A year and two months. A year and a bit, yeah. So you, I saw on one of your posts on LinkedIn uh, some some comment about you being remote. Do, do, does Fox and Hair just work completely remote these days? Do you, do you have an office? What's this? What's the setup? Absolutely. So we all work completely remote. So I live in Canberra. Um, Fox and Hair's office is in Sydney, although it is a um, like one of those share offices. It's called the Hub. Yep. Uh, so we meet there as a team once a month uh, to get together, spend some time together in person. So. But um, beyond that, yeah, we're all completely in our homes. So we have people working in Wollongong. We have a couple in Sydney. We have one down in Geelong, uh, one in Tasmania. Uh, so people are everywhere. Um, and really interestingly, um, the way that works is that when um, the business was started up and staff started coming on, there was very intentional making sure that the online culture was supported and kept going mm. intentionally rather than sort of saying, oh, we need culture but not doing anything about it. And that really shines through in the fact that we all really like each other. Um, we also uh, connect really well online. We also have a team over in Cebu. So I did only talk about the Australian team. We have a team of six in Cebu in the Philippines as well. That's an interesting Interesting. I'm sure others are doing it, but so you know, so the business that I work in is more of a traditional. A we've got an office in Collins Street in Melbourne, and and uh, and we're kind of doing this half working from home, half working from the office uh, thing. But for those businesses that have gone 100 percent remote, how do you kind of keep everyone together? And so you're doing this once once a month. Everyone comes together. So the person that mm -hmm. lives in Geelong, they make their way to the airport. They fly up to Sydney for the day. Is that what that that's what happens? Correct. That's right. And so we all fly in for the day. Uh, I'll often stay for um, a couple of days. Uh, I have a cousin that I stay with down in Bondi, so I get to have really lovely morning walks when I'm in Sydney. Uh, and yeah, we all get there 
to make sure that we're connecting. And when we connect, we tend to do a bit less work because obviously this is our time to chat in person. Uh, we usually have an activity, so most people will stay overnight. Uh, we've done things like uh, axe throwing. We went on a little yacht. We did pole dancing. Um, we have done uh, like bar trivia in a pub. So it's always something different and interesting that we do as a team uh, to connect. And and is there outside of that in person connecting? Like what have you made though? You know, with with such a distance between so many people, you know, obviously people in a different country over in the Philippines, but then just dotted around Australia. Have you managed to keep everyone together and feeling part of a team and working, you know, towards common goals and these kind of things when everyone's so remote outside of the the, the meeting up is there, is there anything that you're doing uh, yeah. outside of that uh, that monthly meetup absolutely so most days of the week we have a 15 minute catch up at the end of every day okay. and it rotates with who is going to talk about themselves so we have a couple of questions prompting questions so that you talk about what's going on with you you know it can be personal it can be business it's sort of what things have you done really well what are you proud of and so everyone cycles through that so we see each other every day as long as obviously you can attend the meeting sometimes people can't uh, on top of that we all have Microsoft teams and instead of writing messages we'll often just call each other where it works and so we're very regularly on the digital video with each other. There's heaps of emojis. There's heaps of gifts. There's all that sort of thing. Like the oldest person in our business is 41. The youngest just turned 20. Yep. Very so we're a different. young group. <laughs> we're very yep. different demographics to, to a lot of other financial advice businesses, which Absolutely. may which maybe leads into prior to Fox and Hair, can you maybe give us a bit of a recap of, of your time in financial advice prior to joining Fox and Hair? Yeah, sure. So I've been an advisor for six and a half years now. And the first organization I joined was actually a single plan of practice. I learned a lot, but I wasn't there for a very long time. But it was my first experience. I literally just jumped straight in. So uh, really be brief background. I was a stay-at-home parent for four and a half years. Uh, my partner was in the military, so I followed him around Australia. And then when he became injured, we swapped roles. So he became the stay-at-home parent and I became the working parent and decided to jump into financial advice. Mm. Became an advisor five months after joining the company. So very, very quick, no experience beyond loving talking about finance. Uh, I've worked for two firms since that first one. So in total, four firms. So it feels like a lot. Um, and in that time, I've actually had 14 months of parental leave with child number three as well. Uh, it, what we have at Fox and Hair is so different to what I've experienced in other financial advice firms, which have been bigger. Um, mainly because there's a real sense of we need to make sure that everyone feels really good to do their jobs really well. Yep. I could go a million ways with that, but why don't you <laughs> ask me a question? <laughs> so, how does, so, so, how does that, how is Fox in here making you feel really good so that mm -hmm. you're then really good at your job? Yeah. How, how, what can others do in their businesses to make their advisors and everyone else that works in the business feel really good too? Good question. True. Because that's, that's the point of this. We're all learning. Uh, so, let me give you some practical examples. Number one is uh, I love getting gifts. And so, the first year at Fox and Hair, I was receiving gifts for things. So, I passed my CFP exam. The next day, champagne and chocolates and a letter were on my doorstep. Yes. Which is a bit extraordinary. I receive gifts for my birthday. Um, and I, you know, everyone loves getting surprise gifts, those sorts of things. Uh, and so that's kind of number one. Number two is our values align. Mm. So Fox and Hair is very big on, uh, equality, support, um, the environment. And that's kind of me. As well, like at home, I um, am always trying to think of ways that I can do better. I have three children, I have a husband, like it's a challenge to do better. But at the moment, like we have chickens, we have gardens, we have bees, uh, we're growing our own food. I do try to pick up litter when I, you know, wander down the street. So the values align for me with the company. Other things are like, so 
almost 12 months ago, more than 12 months ago, I think, um, Fox and Hare became a certified B Corp. And again, that's yep. the values alignment. So I remember my very first time meeting Jess and Glenn in person, and Jess has now exited the company uh, to work on an amazing new project. Uh, when the first time I met them was uh, at a breakfast. And one of the first things Jess said to me was, oh, we've just made a policy where we have three months worth of parental leave for anyone who needs to take leave and we'll pay superannuation guarantee for up to 12 months if that person takes unpaid leave on top of that. Now, having come from some previous firms where parental leave either doesn't exist or feels woefully inadequate, Mm. I hugged Jess and I was like, that is amazing. I love that. I am having no more children. I will not take advantage of this. But I absolutely love that as a very small company, they said we need to get policy in place that if someone is having a baby, that they don't feel really stressed to have to come back to work really soon. Mm. And that those are some of the things that um, Fox and Hare um, – works to its – like lives by its values Absolutely. and that makes a difference to me. Yeah. So, so, on, so on the topic of parental leave, mm-hmm. you know, you've, you've worked in a few other businesses. Mm-hmm. Uh, you just spoke you know, really highly of, of what Fox and Hare is doing. But the parental leave generally in financial advice, do you, do you think it's a – is it being dealt with at a – like at a bare minimum, there's a – you know, the law mm. says we need to do this, so that's what we're doing. We're not going any further above, like, you know, the, the SG for a whole year. That, that's incredible, mm. uh, particularly for, for a small business. Um, is your sense that most businesses are just doing the bare minimum that they need to to get by? Look, I haven't looked in a lot of businesses, but I would argue that businesses that are run by um, – let's call it out, straight white men, probably don't think about how important it is for Mm. a woman or even like the partner, not the person who's carrying the baby, to actually have that time. So when I went on leave for my first – for my first child, 18 months – I was supposed to take 12 months off. I asked for an extra six months because I was exhausted. I was not having fun and I could not cope. Um, and to think that I might have had to go back to work after six weeks or three months would have been just – I wouldn't have been a functioning member of the team. And uh, I would say that because it is a male-dominated industry, I think we have 19 or 20% of women are fin- uh, financial planners are women. Mm. Um, therefore, there are not as many who are bosses. It really isn't something that is looked at closely enough Um, And I wonder whether people look at it as, well, this is going to be a cost to our business and we're not going to get a benefit. But the benefit is actually in that your staff are happy. They feel comfortable taking time off. They're not stressed about having to um, figure out how to stay at home with their baby and then they're going to come back early and their brains are probably going to be shot. Like some people might be fine, but I was not. And a lot of people will not be. It's an extraordinary thing to have to go through. So, like I'm happy that the government is now doing, I think it's 26 weeks of um, parental leave, which is amazing. Uh, And um, I really still want to see superannuation guarantee for 12 months uh, Mm. for primary carers, predominantly women. One of the other things I wanted to point out while we have this platform is the CPD legislation doesn't actually have any leeway for um, going on extended leave, including carer's leave or parental leave. You still have to do your 40 hours of CPD. I was not aware. So one of the advisors here will go on maternity leave in three months' time and so does she. And I didn't even know. Does she, do, will she plans on taking twelve months off? Mm-hmm. She'll still have to do her forty hours of CPD for the for the year that she's not advising. Otherwise, she fails that CPD yep. requirement. Yeah, Absolutely. Right. And I look. I'm happy to be proven wrong, but I'm pretty, pretty sure I'm right that it's baked into the yeah, legislation. Right. Whereas um, there are lots of others, medical providers, lawyers, accountants. I'm pretty sure I did a research subject on this in my masters. They 
rely on the industry body. It's not enshrined in law that you mm. have to do CPD, which means then that the industry body says, yes, of course, 12 months parental leave, two years parental leave, you don't have to do it. Or you might have to do so many hours over a five-year period. Yeah. Uh, so that's something that we need to work on because it is just 40 hours. I mean, you can crack out 40 hours at Kaplan, you know, in the middle of the night, um, while you're sitting up breastfeeding, just do like a little bit of CPD. But, um, that kind of takes us into these, the next thing I want to talk about, which is microaggressions against women in financial advice. And whilst people might say, well, it's not a big deal, it's just 40 hours of CPD for an entire year while you're on parental leave, it's these tiny little barriers that stop women from being financial advisors because you just Mm. keep adding a brick after a brick after a brick and eventually they just go, I just, nah. It's all just too hard. Mm. How how can we make it a better place for for women in financial advice. I know that's a that's a big <laughs> topic. I don't know which how, how to tackle it and I certainly don't have the answers. But being a white male in financial advice, <laughs> how how do we do it? Do, do, does it start with, you know, the likes of Fox and Hare doing some amazing things to be really supportive? Is that where it starts? Is there some some pushing to the likes of the the financial advice bodies, F and, and and the others? Like where do we go? How, how do we how do we make it a more appealing place for, for women in financial advice? There's so many things we can do. And I had a conversation recently with someone who is trying to be an advisor uh, and she was telling me her what she's currently dealing with in, in her organization. I just said to her, wow, you're in a toxic place. Like this shouldn't be your journey. Let's find you a better employer. Um, so part of that is the issues like you have to – find the place that fits you, but there are lots of things we can do. For example, the government has recently said that anyone with more than 100 employees has to publish their gender pay gap. So that reporting will start in 2024. I would love every single financial advice firm to have a serious look at their pay and their gender pay gap and across like same or similar roles. Um, including bonuses and think really, really critically, are you being totally fair or do you have unconscious bias about, well, she's not performing as well, even though she might be, she might just not be given the opportunities that the male has because in our brains, I do it too. We go, okay, well, the guy who's 40 or 50 with a beard is more experience than the woman in her, th- her 30s who's like a little bit tubby like me. And that's actually st- like that is research that has been done to show yeah. how unconscious bias affects the way that we view people. And so people might think that they're actually being really fair, um, but in actual fact – if you get someone externally to look at it or if you critically think, am I being fair and have a look at the numbers and have a look at the data, you may find that you're not. So I would love to see not just the 100, empl- 100 or more employee- employees publish this, but every single advice firm looks critically at this and making sure that everyone's being given the same opportunities yeah, and the same pay. And Yeah, and, and, I, and I think in a lot of businesses there, there will be a degree of unconscious bias. It's not. It's not until someone. It's really not until someone external sending and saying, "Well, why is it so?" Like, you know, like as you were talking, the thing that kind of pops into my head is, you know, you spoke about the fifty-year-old male or the or the thirty-year-old female. You're looking at it going, "Well, the the, the female's taken time off work for maternity leave. They haven't worked as an advisor for. You know, they've they've been working as an advisor for five years, but in that five years, they've been in and out and in and out and in and out." Uh, and and the males worked for five years, and so so we as as a business we say, well, the advisors, the male advisor, because they haven't taken time off, they've they've progressed in their career, so we should be paying them here. But the, the females, as much as she's kind of been in and out of the workforce, she's still been working as an advisor for five years, and 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 I would imagine that that itself creates a degree of gender pay gap uh, that mm. that creeps, and and whether that should be paid, whether that shouldn't be paid. Uh, not until someone 
stands back and starts to point it out that that then the business needs to start to be making decisions on how they're dealing with all of that. Absolutely. And it comes all the way down for businesses. And I would love for everyone who listens to this to have a look at what their business says. So in your job ads, on your website, in your marketing, the unconscious bias is ginormous. And so if companies say, well, no woman ever applies to us, it may be your culture. It may be your reviews on Glassdoor. It may be the fact that your job ad has words that women will turn away from because they're like, nah, I can, I can sense that this is a a bit of a toxic culture mm. uh, and I'm just not going to even bother applying. Yeah. Women self-select out a lot more. Or they do or they do end up applying and get a job there but then all of a sudden six months later they've left and they've gone somewhere else and you're sitting there wondering, well, how come we don't have any female advisors? What are, what are we doing wrong? They're, uh, Absolutely. They're, they're just they're moving on without necessarily – Yeah. And by contrast, let me tell you how I feel. Um, People are probably going to have to pry me from fox and hare. Yeah. Like I am not, you know, people say, oh, you should still be looking out. I No, I'm not going anywhere. Unless something radically changes, I have no, there is no way you could make me leave because it's not just about the money. It's also about how you feel emotionally and how it affects your life. And I'm sure that a lot of advisors over the past couple of years have experienced how work affects their life in quite a negative way. And um, I would really love for more financial advice firms to actually help people feel positive, even when it's really busy. Like we're not exactly mm. quiet. We're yeah. very busy. Uh, yeah. And I was, you know, this is the first time that I've ever spoken to you. We've been speaking for a whole 22 minutes. <laughs> and I get that sense from you now that, that you know, that you're, you've found your home. Mm. Uh, as much as it might be in a different state, but you've found your home and uh, something – Something drastic is going to have to change for you to decide to move on from from there. So the you know the the recruiters that are always in, hitting up everyone on LinkedIn, uh, good mm. luck to them. It doesn't sound like you're uh, you're going anywhere. That's right. And I'm also trying really hard to help the young ones coming through figure out where they can land without having to go through um, the toxic pathway first to learn. So I am trying to direct people in certain ways so that if you, you're a place that might be find it hard to keep women, it might be that all the women are steering them away from you. Yeah. You know, that's the <laughs> – You've a couple of times the young ones. Like you're not mm-hmm. – I wouldn't say you're old. I, How- I'm about to hit 40. Okay. I feel oh, very – I mean, I'm, I feel – yeah. I'm, I'm the same. I'm the same. I – my, the, like the, the lines on my face would say, <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm, I'm getting older. And it's and it's when you know, you, you're you talking about the young ones, it's when, uh, and then we'll we kind of next bit that I want to talk to you about is like people approaching you, you know, you, you, you're talking about steering them in, in the right direction. Mm. How are people coming across you? Are, are like people reaching out to you through LinkedIn or wherever? Like, are you, are you getting to a point now? In, and I've noticed that in really in the last year in myself, the young ones, as you put it, kind of coming to me saying, "Hey, what were, you know? What did you actually study at uni? What was your career path? Like, what have you actually done to get to where you get to?" Mm. Uh, that's when a, a bit of a light bulb's gone off in my head to say, oh, "Actually, I'm not one of the young ones anymore. I'm one of the older ones." Um, is that is that what you're finding as well? Yeah. So I say the young ones because they can literally be half my age and have already been working for two years. Yeah. So like. It, it, I say, when I say, I say the young ones, but it, they're younger than me mostly. So one of the things that I did, like I try to, with varying degrees of when I'm able to, uh, be on LinkedIn and, um, highlighting issues for, uh, women in financial advice, especially. I try to be vocal. I'm not, I, I'm at the point in my life where I'm not worried about the backlash anymore because I know that I have privilege um, and I know that I have security and so I can be a voice for people who um, are really worried about standing up and therefore losing their job. So when last year I went to the FPA Congress and uh, I got a scholarship to do that, which was very kind. 
Um, and one of my former colleagues was part of the uh, emerging professionals cohort. And so she and I have talked about financial advice and women a lot. And so she kept on introducing me to people and saying, you need to talk to Trish. I had a few drunken conversations around people and how much they earn and how they really should be. They are getting ripped off and they should earn more. Uh, a few of them have then gone on to change jobs and get more money, which is fantastic. I'm, oh, I love that so much. Yeah. <laughs> I remember reading that on LinkedIn. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. And that, Part of that is because of my experience. I know what it is like to be ripped off, a very first employer who you thought you could trust. So, um, and I know that I have been paid less than my male colleagues, uh, literally $10,000 left less doing the same job. So I know what it's like and I don't want people to have to go through that. So, um, as an example, one of my former colleagues is working with someone and he reached out and said, I'm working with someone. I'd really love for you to have a chat with her because she's feeling quite, feeling like maybe she doesn't want to do advice um, because of the place we're in. Uh, so absolutely happy to have a chat with her. I have, um, I'm on the FPA mentoring program. So last yep. year I mentored one person, this year I'm mentoring two. Um, so get to have really wonderful conversations with these people around uh, what their plans are, what their goals are and how I can help them. And just more generally, people tend to reach out to me now. Yeah, it's on LinkedIn. People will connect other people with me uh, because – at the moment, I'm very like I have time to be able to have conversations with people and really talk to them around. Well, what are you trying to get out? Is your experience normal? Um, what should you be asking for? Helping people how to ask for more money, um, and if not, then steering them in the right direction to try and find other places to work. Uh, I have a big problem with. Um, I feel like especially a lot of women get taken advantage of earlier in their career. So they they come in, they join, they might be a client services officer or a power planner, and then their uh, job progression gets stalled much more than men do. So they get delayed, um, stuck in these roles or stuck in the associate role for longer when they want to be advisors, which is very frustrating because if if we don't, be open and honest with the people that are progressing through about how long things really take, what salaries you can expect as you progress through, they'll just get frustrated and go somewhere else, yeah. someone who promises them something more. And we know that the professional year is slow. It's not really a year. It's more like 18 months, I've heard, uh, what's what people tend to say, So, which can be so frustrating. You're like, I just want to be an advisor. You mentioned a couple of times the FPA Congress or F mm -hmm. FAA um, now it's called. You wanted to talk about um, childcare and mm. conference and I said, what are you talking about when, <laughs> when we were uh, – before we pressed to record? Maybe over to you to maybe talk about what the, the particular thing that you wanted to do and then I don't know, how do you kind of drum up support to you? <laughs> things on a list or something, but talk us through your idea for, for, for child care at conference. Sure. Let me give you the background of why, first of all. So, uh, in 2019, my third child, Felix, was born. Uh, sorry, 2018, he was born. 2019, I really wanted to go to FinCon. I had wanted to go the previous year, but unfortunately, I ended up getting pregnant, so I couldn't. I had to cancel that. And I was like, I am determined to go. Thank God I did because the next year was 2020 and I would not have gone. Uh, mm. For ages, uh, life, isn't it? in Team America, concept. yeah, exactly. Uh, and it's filled for people who don't know. It's filled with financial nerds, not just financial planners. Um, all amazing things, you know, content creators, that sort of stuff. Uh, you can learn a lot from the Americans. Uh, so Felix, I really wanted to go. He was nine and a half months old. He was still breastfed. There was no way I could leave him for two weeks. Uh, fortunately, FinCon had free childcare that they were trialing for the first time. So I registered straight away for that to be on the free childcare list, got in, got my space, which meant that I had three days at FinCon where I dropped Felix off at childcare. I went and did FinCon, picked him up for lunch, dropped him back off, 
did morphine con, picked him up at the end, like the end of the day. Yeah. So I couldn't go out and party, which was fine because our sleep schedules were so messed up that I ended up just waking up at 1 and 2 a.m. with him and we went and chatted with all the drunk people down at the um, who were having a great time coming home. Some of the <laughs> best conversations I've had. And Good. having a baby is a great in <laughs> to these yeah. like famous podcasters and bloggers. That was amazing. Yeah. And it really helped. It helps with inclusivity, making sure that people who may not have the resources to figure out how to get to these events, get to these events. So what I would love to see is for the next FAAA Congress in November is that we have childcare there. And the reason for that is you may be like me, have gone on parental leave. Uh, you may be currently working, but maybe your child's only in childcare two or three days a week. Maybe you're breastfeeding and you can't not take your child with you overnight or for a couple of days. Um, if you, we don't want to have to women, we don't want primary carers, predominantly women to have to say, I can't go to this industry event that I'd like to go to because I have a child. That's another one of those little barriers. And you can't reasonably have an entire two days of conference with a baby with you. I mean, really tiny baby, yeah, but once they start crawling, like you can't concentrate. It's hard. You could, but like that's a lot. I took Felix when he was three and a half months old to a um, two-day conference and that was easy because he just slept and he breastfed and he was practically invisible. Um, so I have talked to the FAAA about it. I have sort of done all of the groundwork and sort of handed it off to them and said, I really want this to happen. But what I love from uh, the the listeners is if you would take advantage of childcare at Congress or if you know someone who might, please let me know. Look me up on LinkedIn. Send a message yep. through to the podcast and they can get it to me. I would love to know who might actually utilize this. I imagine there would be some people who would. Most of the people I know don't have very small children anymore, but it's one of those things that can make the difference for women being able to be more involved in the industry as we turn into a profession. Yeah. We had, um, when we had young kids, there was a, um, back then we were licensed through one of the, one of the big groups, we had it two years or so, 18 months, two years. We were kind of self-licensed for a while. Then we went to one of the big licenses. Then we went back to self-licensed. And there was a, a, uh, a conference in, uh, up in the Gold Coast, I think it was. I can't remember where it was. Yeah, the Gold Coast. Uh, and we had our first child then and I was heavily involved in the feeding. So I was doing all of the feeding of a night time for mm. him. And and. F- for me to not be at home for two or three days at that conference was just not going to work. So we ended up, um, my wife and Thomas, my, my my eldest son, the baby back then, he ended up just coming with us. And so I was kind of doing this feeding of a night time and as he kind of didn't do the partying, but I was, wasn't interested in doing the partying <laughs> anyway. Um, that, we made it work that way. Um, oh, obviously not that I wasn't the primary carer, but we made it work of a night time. That way, that yeah, that Gabby, my wife, and uh, and my son were with us. So. Yeah, yeah, it's Good um, it's you you do what you need to do. Um, yeah, exactly. I would also say that something that could be quite easy, um, because let's go with small wins and build on it. So, um, do congresses have a pumping room? Yes. Do they have a breastfeeding room? When I joined my previous company, I was um, I didn't tell them because again, like there's there's, there's levels of um, not shame, but wanting to hide, not wanting to be difficult. Um, I was actually uh, I didn't tell them, and I was just pumping in the disabled bathroom, and then my um, receptionist found out, and she's like, "No, no, 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 this is not happening." And I said, "I kind of had a look at all the rooms." like all the offices and there's nothing really that suits and she's like I'll sort it out. And so she got got you know got contractors in they put like film up in a room so at least there was a designated um like a, a nice room that wasn't no one could see in. Yeah. And then and then covid happened so I was like well not getting much use out of this room but recently one of my former colleagues uh she said to me thank you so much 
for getting that room done um, because she's using it all the time now. Fantastic. And, and if, if congresses, if industry conferences, so your licensee conferences, all they have to do is say, we have a room for breastfeeding or for pumping if you need, please let us know. You know, send us an email, talk to this person. If no one uses it, then no one uses it. But if you say that you have it and you have it, then maybe someone won't need to jump that extra hurdle of asking for it. Yep. Yep. Now, the last the last thing that we wanted to tackle was new adult advisors. Mm. Um, I, so, you won't be aware, but I just record a podcast I recorded last week. I don't think it's come out just yet. Um, did a podcast with a couple of the... Uh, associate advisors that work here, uh, and one's done the traditional path of go to university, kind of get into accounting, financial planning, kind of straight after uni, and it's working through being an associate advisor. And and one of the other guys that was on the podcast um, has come to financial advice a little bit later on in in life, so it's had to do the studying and so forth. But yeah, let, let's talk about new adult ad- ad- advisors. The particular challenges for them, like mm. where, 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 where do where do you want to start? Uh, well, I imagine the biggest challenge is if you've already had a career, you have a sa- you had a salary, and mm. your family is living off that salary. To then go all the way back to the beginning again, you have to take a significant pay cut. More than like you know, you're not going to get paid the same if you're you've been an accountant um, for 20 years, and then you want to become a financial advisor. Like your salary is not matching. Same thing with uh, I met someone who was an optometrist actually, and then be- is a, in her professional year now. So that's a real challenge that I don't know whether we've talked about much in the profession um, mm. of the how do we actually get um, career changes. So not fresh out of school with you know not as many expenses, but people with significant life, probably a mortgage, probably kids, uh, how do we help them to become advisors without taking huge financial damage to their budget? Now, for me, when I became an advisor in sort of my mid-30s, I hadn't been working for four and a half, or hadn't been employed rather, for four and a half years. Uh, and then, but we were on like a very low income. You know, we were claiming from Centrelink when I was first an advisor, but we didn't have stupid high expenses. We did have a mortgage, but it was like Western suburbs, outer Western suburbs of Melbourne. So it was like a low mortgage than pay maybe middle of Sydney or <laughs> somewhere like that. Um, so I was fortunate in that regard. But if I had have built up a career and then tried to become a financial advisor. I don't know whether my family could do it now. Sure. I don't have an answer. I just know that we need to be, as a profession, we need to think about how we're going to get these um, career changes to become professional year people because they come with a wealth of skill. You know, they already know how to talk to people. They already know how to um, craft emails, you know, all, all the things that you kind of need to train people straight out of uni on oftentimes. Um, they've got the life experience. They just need to know financial advice. What are your thoughts with it? Look, I had a, I had a conversation with uh, the son of one of my clients that in his early 30s and Young family and mortgage and all the rest of it. This whole career change thing. They had a it, it built up a, a career in 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 what he was doing, but wanted to get into financial advice. I can't in, just because I can't even remember the reason why. But you know, let's just say it was just because he wanted to. Mm-hmm. Uh, and yeah, the, the big part of the conversation that that I had with him was that you you need to first thing you need to work out is your family finances. You need to just understand that you're going to go back. You know, you're earning I don't know whatever he was earning. You know, north of a hundred thousand dollars in his career that he'd built up, you're going to go back to being a client service manager, associate advisor, these kind of things. You're going to take a decent pay cut to to do it. But if this is something that you want to do, the sooner you do it, the better. Because as you as your as you get older, as your existing career continues to grow, you're going to earn more. Your kids are going to get older. They're going to become more expensive. With you know, it's you know, ch- kids when they when they're newborn aren't terribly expensive unless you've got Big medical costs you're having to deal with, but but outside of that, it's, it's not a not a lot of lot of money uh, is is going to be required. And then 
so he's, yeah, well, we're kind of talking through to him exactly to your point. You need to understand that there is going to be this step back for you to then move move up. And if it's something that you want to do and you're really successful in it, good you know, good good luck to you. Um, he then went away and had to kind of just dwell on it and work out, you know, between him and his partner, how could they make it work? The next meeting, I haven't I haven't since spoken with him, but I've met with with the clients a couple of times since. Uh, and I was really I was really happy to hear uh, that not long after, probably six or nine months after, I'd had that conversation with him that he decided to he decided to move into financial advice and got a job with one of the one of the businesses in Melbourne uh, in some type of entry level role into 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 financial advice. Yeah, it's the it's the, the challenge, and, and I, I don't know. I don't. I don't think we can expect people to come across their earning one hundred and thirty thousand dollars a year over here doing their job, and then all of a sudden we're going to pay them one hundred and thirty thousand dollars a year for an entry level job. Then you get back to the pay gap, you know, problem problem before. It's just. I think it's just something that people need to. You know, how do we? There's probably a bit of a. I haven't thought of this through before. I'm kind of just thinking on the spot as we're talking about it. There's probably a means for fast tracking those types of people through in that there's a there's a whole lot of as you said talking to people crafting emails all of this type of stuff that you learn in your first few years of of having a job out of university that these people already have that so that they potentially don't need to spend so much time in in those more admin type jobs before they become a financial advisor or at least start the professional year Mm -hmm. so maybe you you know, you employ them for three or six months. They pass their probation. You, you know, you're, you're happy that they're a re- they're, they're a good person and they're a good fit for the business. And then you kick them off on the professional year mm. straight away, knowing that as you, as you said, it's going to, probably going to take them eighteen months anyway to get through the professional year. Yeah, maybe that's the way to do it. Yeah, I also think that we need to point out to people that this is a really amazing career. I love what I do. Sure, all of us would love the compliance burden to be less, wouldn't we all? But this career is so flexible. This career is, it feels really good to help people. Uh, and you can significantly increase your income over you know once you've passed your professional year once you gather some experience if you're doing well you can quickly get above six figures you know hundred thousand dollars plus those are the um the salaries that are around there these days with a little bit of experience kind of need them these days with inflation rates and <laughs> the way the mortgage interests keep going up but um I know that um, I have talked about how things can be really hard uh, and how much more we need to do, but I can tell you that as a female in financial advice, I would not be anywhere else because I get to do so much, to help so much, to change so much. It feels good and I get paid well for it. Yeah, and and, and, and you in particular, you're doing a lot to give back you know, just in some of the things that you mentioned now, quite aside from the volunteering and everything else that that you're doing through Fox and Hair, like just being part of this mentoring program with you know with other advisors and being open to chat, I, I would imagine that 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 brings a degree of satisfaction to you as well. Not only are you you enjoy the job that you do as a day job, but being able to kind of give back and support others that are coming through, uh, I, I, I would imagine that's uh, yeah a lot of satisfaction for you as well. Absolutely. I love it. Um, and I draw from, like I said, my own experiences of not particularly being uh, well looked after in the beginning by um, an employer. Whereas, so I just try to help people to avoid those um, mistakes in the beginning so that they can see how amazing it is. Because sometimes, you know, you just have to drudge through the drudgery to get to where you want to be and to figure out what you want. Like I didn't know whether I wanted to work with retirees, with self-managed super funds, with whatever, um, but millennial, working with millennials is my absolute jam. Well, Trish, thank you for joining me this morning. It's been a pleasure to speak with you. Great to finally chat. Uh, thanks for coming on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. This has been wonderful. And uh, if anyone wants to connect, find me on LinkedIn, Trish Gregory. Uh, shouldn't be too hard to find, hopefully. That's it. We'll put some links in the show notes and wherever you're watching or listening, I was going to say watching wherever you're listening this <laughs> up. 
uh, to this, there'll be some links to find Trish. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.